Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. This week on the show, we ask the question, is gravel getting a bit much in road races? Plus, we recap all the racing just gone from Valencia, Saudi Tour, and Etoile de Bessege. Starting off in Spain, though, and the Tour of Valencia, the Volta al Comunitat Valenciana, kicked off last Wednesday with a 166 km stage finishing in Torreba del Pina. Remco Evenpol solo to victory in dominant fashion, jumping clear with 4.7 kilometers to go on the race's first stage. He held a 13-second lead with around 2K to the finish. Alexander Vlasov of Bora Hansgrohe hot in pursuit, but it was the young Belgium who took the win, savoring the first victory of the year for Quickstep Alpha Vinyl. Vlasov held on to second place on the day ahead of Carlos Rodriguez of Ineos Grenadiers in third. Stage two saw a bunch sprint after Quickstep Alpha Vinyl controlled much of the day to help keep Evan Paul's lead on GC. Dylan Toons was solo over the top of the final climb, staying clear of most of the trouble behind as the pace upped to the finish. David Decker of Jumbo Visma going clean off the road and into the forest at one point, whilst another rider from Uskatel crashed hard too. Thankfully, all were reported as okay and remounted to the finish. Toons was soon swept up by the chasing pack, paving the way for a fast bunch kick. Ryan Gibbons was out of the running for UAE after a crash around three and a half K to go. He too, thankfully, remounted. Fabio Jakobsen took the win at the end of it all by a clear margin too, perhaps two, maybe three bike lengths ahead of Milano and Viviani. Quick step Alpha Vinyl, making it two from two. Stage three saw perhaps an element of debate before the off, leading to the talking point of today's show. Evan Paul had questioned the gravel summit finish before the stage, stating to media that on a recce of the course on a January training camp, he thought that his GPS was wrong, noting the presence of large rocks and loose stone. Basically, a gravel track then. Organisers defended themselves, saying that since then, the service had been compacted and rocks removed. Matteo Trentin weighed in on the debate too during the week, saying that gravel sectors in stage races were going too far to a spectacle we don't need. The thought from some seems to be that Strada Bianca is Strada Bianca and all this gravel popping up everywhere else is getting a little too much. If you didn't know, there is actually another gravel race on the calendar this year, the Classica Suan Parezio Interior, a 1.1 ranked event running February the 22nd, which is billed as being Spain's answer to Strada Bianca. And it includes a number of dirt sections. The appetite for such racing is obviously growing from a fan perspective and definitely creates a more exciting dynamic as a viewer. But should we be aware of a line that can't be crossed in our pursuit for ever more thrilling racing? Are we slowly moving away from road racing and creating too much of a separate discipline within the sport, a sort of gravel road fusion, or is this just part of the ever-changing dynamic a sport goes through? We've seen race distances reduced over the decades. Are gravel sectors just the new modern day race course? Personally, I'm all for it. It makes the race up, it keeps it exciting. I guess the only negative is how it increases the reliance of good luck on a race's outcome. When you up the ante too much, I think road races can start to edge into the realms of a slight fast, decide less on talent and strength and more luck. It's something I've seen before as a rider, gravel sectors are one thing, but every now and again, it did get a little bit too silly, especially when your team cars couldn't even make it through. Let us know in the comments section though, I'll be interested to hear your thoughts and if you disagree. Back to the racing though, and stage three did prove to be a spectacle with a select group forming on that final gravel climb. Full Sang nearly misjudged a corner, but aside from that, there didn't appear to be any controversies. It was Alexander Vlasov who emerged the strongest, gliding away solo up the Storato, dropping Evan Paul who finished eighth on the stage. Carlos Rodriguez for Ineos, again in amongst it, was second, some 14 seconds back, and Enrique Mass a further seven seconds back to take third. Vlasov, for his efforts, moved into the yellow leader's jersey with a healthy 32 second cushion on Evan Paul in second. Matteo Moschetti took the fourth stage into Torre Vieja after what looked like a particularly nervous finale. Jumbo Visma and Team DSM unfortunately having to pull out before the stage due to a number of COVID cases in their camp. It would be Jakobsen again who would win the race's final stage ahead of Viviani and Christoph to make it three wins from five for Quickstep in Valencia. At the end of it all, Vlasov took the overall, the first GC win of his career and perhaps a strong signal of his potential in 2022. That move to Bora Hansgrohe already looking like a good one. 
Evan Paul finished up second, praising Vlasov's strength and signalling that the win went to the stronger rider, although still questioning that gravel section somewhat in the media, saying it was too close to mountain biking. Carlos Rodriguez was perhaps the revelation of the race in third. Strong stuff from the Spanish 21-year-old, and I'm sure not the only result he'll be getting this season. Jakobsen as well, showing that he is most definitely back to his best, which is very good to see. Valencia also saw the women's peloton meet for the first time this year. The Vuelta Comunitat Valencia Femeninas, a one-day race over 92 kilometers. This year's edition, the fourth in the race's history, saw a fast pace from the outset and no real breakaway establishing itself. It ended up being an incredibly hectic bunch sprint to decide the winner. A large crash inside two and a half kilometers to go saw a number of riders go down heavily and another hard crash on the finish straight by Chiara Consoni. It was Marta Bastianelli, however, for UAE team ADQ who emerged victorious from the melee, taking her 35th professional victory. Sanquianetti finished second and Catherine Swineberger third after the relegation of Barbara Goreshi, who was deemed to have left her line and caused that crash of Consoni. Quite clear to see actually from the overhead. Brilliant win though by Bastianelli, getting her season off to a perfect start. From Spain now though, we head to the Middle East and the Saudi Tour, which saw the usual display of echelons and fast, fast racing in the desert. And the opening day was one that was, well, we didn't, we didn't see much of it. The TV aeroplane was not granted permission to take off, and so we only initially saw the final 300 meters. Recorded footage was later sent, and we got to see the gravel section for the first time. Andrea Baglioli was one of the riders to come down, but thankfully his injuries weren't too serious. More gravel again in the pro calendar's opening week of racing. In the finish straight, a perfect lead out from Lotto Sudal, finished off impressively by Caleb Ewan, saw them take their third win of the season, even though we are less than a week into it. The first of the climbs came the following day and it marked the first pro win for Santiago Butrago of Bahrain victorious. The 22-year-old Colombian made the only real attack on the climb, followed initially by Daniel Oz and then bridged to by Baggioli. However, that effort clearly took a lot out of the Italian and he was easily outsprinted by Butrago to the line. That might have been the first time Butrago has won a pro race, but it isn't the first time he's raised his arms aloft in celebration. He did so on stage of the 2020 Tour of Luxembourg, only to realize there was still one lap to go. Dylan Grunewagen getting off the mark early for his new team, Bike Exchange Yeko, and taking his first victory for the squad. Ewan looked to be the faster of the sprinters, however, just look at this turn of pace coming from behind. He was too far back though, Grunewagen timed his sprint perfectly thanks to a lead out from Mezjek and it was only Dan McClay who would claim second just ahead of Ewan, who wouldn't have needed the bus back to the hotel if he kept that speed going from the kick to the line. Stage four of five of the Saudi Tour, the Queen stage, finished up a three kilometer climb with ramps of 22%. The line wasn't at the top though, as an eight kilometer plateau would await the riders. Crosswinds caused trouble early on with groups shredded everywhere. Petrago lost out, finding himself in the second group on the road and saw his lead disappear into the dust as Quickstep Alpha Vinyl put the peloton to the sword. Andrea Baggioli for Quickstep was the first to attack on that final climb and was soon joined by another 22 year old, Maxime Van Glees. It would actually be Van Glees who would dance away with around 500 meters to go of that climb, vicious looking ascent, visible from the TV cameras. Meanwhile, Butrago put down a brilliant ride himself to rejoin that chase group and not give up on the leader's green jersey. Van Glees would, however, solo away to take the win and to nab that green jersey from Butrago's shoulders. A 40 second winning margin too, ahead of Mezjek, who won the sprint from that chase group. Rui Costa in amongst it too to move into third on GC behind Botrago in second. That is how the overall would actually finish up too after stage five. Van Gies taking his first pro win of his career and the overall to boot. Botrago in second, Costa in third. Grunewagen showing he really is back to his best too with another stage win to finish off the Saudi tour on the final day ahead of McClay and Ballerini in an all out bunch kick. 
Honourable mention of the tour goes to Tim de Klerk for a fourth place overall finish, probably rode the front of every echelon all race two, and as a result also earns himself GCN Rider of the Week, in my opinion anyway. Maxime Van Gies though taking the plaudits and well deserved too. Back in Europe and over to France at the Etoile de Bessage, where arguably the toughest racing to start the season can be found. It was Mads Pedersen who took the opening stage ahead of Hugo Hofstetter and Boston Hagen in an uphill sprint, a late attack by Chris Lawless just falling short in the closing stages and allowing Pedersen to open his account for Trek in 2022. Filippo Ganna finished an impressive seventh after driving the front echelon towards the finish with eyes on that usually decisive final TT and overall GC. Brian Cockard was the winner of the second stage, Pedersen this time settling for second in another uphill sprint. Cockard, for his new team, Cofidis, taking his ninth stage win at the early season French stage race. His first was back in 2013. He has taken wins in six different editions to this race, which is a mighty impressive stat, and that win marked his first in over 18 months. Obviously, a race he enjoys. Cofidis would go on to have a cracking race too. Benjamin Thomas taking out the third stage, winning solo by nine seconds over Betiol, and it would be Thomas who would go on to win the overall after that effort. Tobias Hallen Johansson, last year's Tour de l'Avenir winner, took out stage four for Uno X, ahead of Jay Vine of Alpecin Phoenix. Filippo Ganna did take that final TT win ahead of Pedersen and Thomas. Benjamin Thomas sealing the overall ahead of Betiol and Johansson in third. Jay Vine put in a solid performance to win the Mountains jersey, plus that second place on stage four and an eighth place on the final TT. Vine averaged 516 watts on the final ascent there, plus 441 watts for the whole TT. His split was only 411 watts for the flat section of the course, however, as noticed by Amati O'Reilly on Twitter. Only 22 seconds down on Ghana at the finish too. That guy can TT, as well as climb, it appears. It was an all action on the road, however. Kraten Cross took place over the weekend in Lille, the penultimate round of the X2O Bad Cameras Trough, and it was Toon Arts who took home the win for the men, ahead of Niels van der Put and Lars van der Haar. European champion Lucinda Blant taking victory in the women's race ahead of Anne Marie Wurst and Celine del Carmen Alvarado. Brand's 18th win of the winter, too, and winning by a margin of just under a minute. A huge amount of racing this past week then, and lots more coming up for you on GCN Plus this coming week. The biggest event is the two-point pro-ranked Tour de Provence, which marks the start of competition in 2022 for Julian Alaphilippe. He was a runner-up on GC last year behind Ivan Ramirez Souza, who will also be on the start line competing for Movistar. Nardo Quintana, winner in 2020, is also there, whilst Ineos Grenadiers are led by Richard Carapaz and Ethan Hayter. Other riders to watch out for on general classification include Michael Storer, who makes his debut for Group Armour FDJ. Gorka Izagheri, winner in 2019, Quintana's teammate and compatriot, Mikel Eduardo Flores, plus Trek Segafredo's Guilio Ciccone and Antoine Tolhuk. The race is four days long, starts on Thursday, and is available on GCN Plus in the US, in the Asia Pacific, except China, Japan, and New Zealand, and in Europe, except Denmark and France. We've also got the tour of Oman this week, but no live coverage is available anywhere. We'll get highlights up as soon as we can after each stage. Rui Costa, Mark Cavendish, Arnold Demar are amongst the big names competing there. Those highlights are available in Europe, the US, Latin America and the Asia Pacific, excluding Japan, China and New Zealand. This weekend, we've got a couple of one-day races in Spain, both of which are available in all GCN Plus territories. The Tour of Mercia on Saturday and the Clásica del Almira on Sunday. The aforementioned Juan Parezio follows on Monday, and we've also got more cyclocross for you this weekend with a Super Prestige on Saturday and the X2O Bad Kamastroff on Sunday, both available in all GCN Plus territories except Belgium. We've also got a new documentary out tomorrow on GCN Plus, Orbea The Inside Story. Ollie headed off to Orbea HQ for a proper behind the scenes look at one of the oldest bike brands in cycling. He even met Iban Mayer, one of my heroes. Well, well worth a watch if you can, and let us know what you think. Other news that happened during the week gone now, and it was the SD Works team presentation last week, and two bits of news came from it. 
Ashley Moomin Pascio confirmed that this will be her last season as a pro rider, whilst Chantal Vandenbroek Black, who had previously suggested she'll retire after this year's Spring Classics, has decided to go on, not just to the end of the season, but the end of 2024, which will, coincidentally, mean she'll be in the running to win the 2023 World Championships. Why do I pick that race out in particular? Well, that's because the UCI have confirmed the dates of 3rd to the 13th of August 2023 in Glasgow for their newly first styled World Championships mega event that will be held every four years in the year before the Olympic Games. The 11-day event will bring together 13 different cycling World Championships across six different locations in Glasgow, including road, time trial, BMX, indoor and paracycling. With a summer date being announced, plans are yet to be confirmed on how the clashes with the traditional road calendar will be mitigated, with a move from the traditional spot of September. Either way, it's going to be quite the show of cycling, and one which we very much look forward to, despite the fact riders will have to make new decisions about their race calendar that season. On the topic of race calendar, over in the US, the Joe Martin stage race has confirmed it will return in May after partnering with Walmart. Both men's and women's races will see equal prize money, plus is also expected to offer some form of live streaming to race fans. Good news for US cycling, especially hot off the recent Cycross World Championships in the area. Skoda have announced that they will be opening applications for three female riders to be supported and mentored by Dame Sarah Storey in a year-long programme. The aim is to provide support to ambitious cyclists aged between 18 and 24, giving them the chance to maximise their potential within the sport. If you are interested, get in touch and get your applications in. You should find the link down in the description below. In other news, international commissaire Francesca Manori will become the first woman to preside over the race jury of the Tour de France, this year as well as the president of the commissaire's panel. Manori became an international commissaire in 1993 and she has been a member of the race jury at major events such as the World Championships, UAE Tour, Torino Adriatico and various Italian championships. To finish the show, we have promising news from Colombia. Egan Bernal was discharged from hospital after undergoing another successful surgery last week. He returns home to begin his recovery and rehabilitation from 20 different fractures after that horror crash he suffered whilst out training. Good, good news and we really send all our best wishes to Bernal and really hope to see him back on a bike and to his best soon. And that is, we hope, a good note to finish off the show on this week. Fingers crossed for more good news out of Columbia in terms of Bernal's recovery. As always, thanks for watching the show. See you on the next one.